வணக்கம் த மோஸ்ட் காமன்லி என்கவுண்டர்ட் ஃப்ராக்சர் இன் த ஹேண்ட் இஸ் த ஃப்ராக்சர் ஆஃப் த டிஸ்டல் ஃபேலங்ஸ் ஆர் த டெர்மினல் ஃபேலங்ஸ் ஆஸ் இட் இஸ் சம்டைம்ஸ் கால்ட் ஆர் தே நாட் மைனர் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் டூ வி நீட் டு சார்ட் ஆஃப் ட்ரீட் தம் சீரியஸ்லி லைக் சே ப்ராக்சிமல் ஃபேலஞ்சியல் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் அ ஸ்டடி ஷோட் தட் லெஸ் தென் தேர்ட்டி பர்சன்ட் ஆஃப் பேஷண்ட்ஸ் ஹூ ஹட் சஸ்டெயின் த ஃப்ராக்சர் ஆஃப் த டிஸ்டல் ஃபேலங்ஸ் had completely recovered at the end of 6 weeks does this not shed new light on the fracture of the distal phalanx so we do need to take these fractures seriously and treat them right isn't it and that's what we shall be seeing in this video the features and management of fracture of the distal phalanx of the finger the distal phalanx or the terminal phalanx as it is sometimes known may be a small bone on the tip of the finger but nevertheless important since it provides support in the contact areas of the finger to understand about the management of fractures of the distal phalanx we need to understand the anatomy the classification of the fractures that can occur and the features and management of tough fractures shaft fractures and base fractures or articular fractures first let us look at the structure of the terminal phalanx and the important soft tissues around the terminal phalanx the contact area that is the pulp of the finger is on the volar aspect with multiple septae that hold the thickened and glabrous skin to the volar surface of the distal phalanx the flexor digitorum profundus tendon is inserted on the base of the volar aspect of the bone the dorsal aspect of the distal half of the terminal phalanx region is covered by the nail matrix or nail bed as it is sometimes referred to this is covered by the nail plate the skin on the dorsum forms the nail fold to hold the growing nail plate the extensor apparatus known as the terminal tendon in this zone is inserted on the dorsal aspect of the terminal phalanx fractures of the distal phalanx can be classified as tough fractures shaft fractures and base fractures or articular fractures let us first consider the tough fractures of the distal phalanx such fractures are usually caused by a crush injury they can be simple fractures or comminuted fractures simple fractures of the tuft of the distal phalanx may be associated with a subungual hematoma which presents like this that is bleeding that occurs under the nail plate or as a painful swelling of the fingertip a plain x-ray will very clearly reveal the fracture of the tuft of the distal phalanx in cases of subungual hematoma decompression needs to be done which will provide dramatic pain relief and also aesthetic correction if it is not corrected the discoloration of the nail will continue for a few months the decompression needs to be done with a 24 gauge needle by trephining through the nail plate alone till the blood that is collected under the nail plate comes out completely we may need to make multiple trephine holes if necessary this procedure can be done under intrathecal digital block this must be followed up with a short period of immobilization for about 10 to 14 days for symptomatic relief and a gentle compression bandage can also be applied a short course of oral antibiotic therapy will be required since we have trephined the nail plate and hence technically it has now become a compound fracture the comminuted fracture of the tuft of the distal phalanx is usually associated with laceration of the skin nail bed injury and partial nail avulsion when such an injury is encountered it is very important to first ensure that the tip of the finger is viable this schematic diagram shows the laceration of the pulp or the skin the laceration in the nail bed and the partial avulsion of the nail plate which is still attached to the distal portion of the nail matrix under digital block anesthesia a debridement needs to be done this is very important since infection can kill that distal portion of the fractured terminal phalanx 
debridement should be in the form of mechanical debridement and pulsed irrigation with saline. The nail bed laceration next needs to be sutured using fine absorbable sutures. Nail repositioning with figure of 8 stitch needs to be done to hold the nail plate in position. This intact nail plate if available will splint the reduced fracture and the repaired nail bed. Finally, the skin laceration in the pulp region needs to be sutured. After the procedure, a gentle compression dressing can be applied. You can click on the icon above to see the method of application of the compression dressing. Hand elevation must be insisted on. Suture removal needs to be done at 2 weeks and I personally do not apply any external splints. The nail plate itself acts as a splint for the repositioned fracture of the distal phalanx. As far as fractures of the shaft of the distal phalanx are concerned, there are two types. They can be transverse or longitudinal. Non-displaced transverse fractures are usually sufficiently stabilized by the surrounding soft tissues and hence do not routinely require internal fixation. But displaced transverse fractures are usually compound fractures associated with laceration of the overlying nail bed and hence a longitudinal K-wire pin fixation and nail bed repair may be required. Longitudinal fractures of the shaft can be simple fractures or compound fractures. They usually tend to heal quicker than transverse fractures because the amount of bone to bone contact is more. All they need is a gentle compression in the form of a finger crepe bandage to help in the healing process and of course immobilization. The base of the distal phalanx articulates with the middle phalanx at the distal interphalangeal joint. Hence, fractures of the base are usually intra-articular. These fractures are usually unstable fractures and the mechanism by which they occur differs upon whether it's a small avulsion fracture that is less than 20% of the articular surface where avulsion due to tensile force of the extensor terminal tendon or the FDP is the cause depending on whether it is on the dorsal side or on the volar side. Whereas large avulsion fractures that is more than 20% of the articular surface occur mainly because of a shearing force due to axial loading. Base fractures of the distal phalanx are different in adults and in children. In adults, they can be a volar base fracture, a dorsal base fracture or a combined volar and dorsal base fractures and pediatric fractures which are a different entity altogether. The volar base fractures occur due to a forceful avulsion of the insertion of the flexor digitorum profundus which pulls out and fractures a part of the base of the terminal phalanx. There are different methods of management of such volar base fractures of the distal phalanx like pull through sutures or even the use of screws for fixation. The detailed management of such fractures can be obtained by clicking on the icon above. In dorsal base fractures of the distal phalanx, there is an avulsion fracture caused by the pull of the extensor insertion. This results in a mallet finger. The management of such fractures is also varied and fixation can be done with a hook plate, K-wires or extensor block pinning method and the details of all these techniques can be obtained by clicking on the icon above. When there are combined fractures that is the volar base and the dorsal base fractures, internal fixation is a must because stability must be obtained for getting back function of both flexion and extension at the distal interphalangeal joint. Fractures of the base of the distal phalanx in children and adolescents is unique in that the epiphysis is involved. These fractures are known as Seymour fractures which involve an epiphyseal injury of the distal phalanx. This injury usually results from hyperflexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. 
it is the pediatric equivalent of adult bony mallet fractures could belong to any of the salter harris types for instance it could be salter harris type 1 and the easy way to remember type 1 is that the epiphysis is just separated or it could be a type 2 salter harris lesion which is easily remembered by the mnemonic above which has involvement of the diaphysis type 1 and type 2 usually occur in children whereas type 3 can occur in adolescents the type 3 salter harris fracture consists of the fracture of the epiphyseal plate along with the fracture of the epiphysis this is remembered by the mnemonic l lower to know more about the salter harris classification and the mnemonics for remembering the different types please click on the icon above clinically the seymour fracture appears as an open pseudo mallet injury and as mentioned it is a fracture involving the epiphyseal region of the distal phalanx we shall see why it is a pseudo mallet injury even though it presents like a mallet finger we have already seen the anatomy of the terminal phalanx of the finger to reiterate the attachment of the extensor tendon on the dorsal aspect is much more proximal whereas the attachment of the flexor tendon is more widespread on the volar aspect and extends more distally so when there is a fracture of the epiphyseal plate in children flexion of the distal phalanx occurs even though the extensor insertion is intact so it gives the appearance of a mallet finger even though the extensor insertion is totally intact the treatment of this fracture consists of irrigation and debridement reduction of the fracture and repair of the nail matrix and the use of a longitudinal caver to maintain the reduced position of the fracture which is left on for 3 weeks before the k wire is removed to summarize the fractures of the distal phalanx of the finger they can involve the tuft shaft or base most of them can be treated non operatively with appropriate immobilization and care of the associated soft tissue injuries like injuries to the nail bed matrix and the skin there should be a high index of suspicion for the same or fractures which are base fractures in children The principles of conservative management of fractures of the distal phalanx involve close reduction, gentle compression and antibiotic therapy if required. The principles of operative management of fractures of the distal phalanx involve early debridement, accurate reduction of the fractured segment, rigid fixation if it is unstable, nail bed repair to support the fracture healing. and antibiotic therapy the complications that can occur from fractures of the distal phalanx are osteomyelitis delayed union mal union or non union and disturbance of distal phalanx bone growth especially in patients with late presentation of pediatric epiphyseal fracture characterized by the dorsal bump due to the continued growth of the dorsally displaced epiphysis which we have seen in the description of the seymour fracture i hope you enjoyed the video i enjoyed making it please click on the shown links to see more about the basics of metacarpal neck fracture management and the basics of metacarpal head fracture management and do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery trauma surgery and ethics vanakkam